have kind of a full house and it's so good to see everybody again and all of you newbies <laughs> anyway adam where are you at wave your hand he's going to stand up and open in a word of prayer and we'll get started father Lord, thank you just for the day lord the opportunity to uh, be inside this nation lord to have the freedoms that we have I do pray that you bless uh, the bee meeting lord i thank you for just the ability to search out the knowledge and uh, the, of your creation thank you for safety for our Guest speaker, Lord, we do ask that you be with us as we go home tonight. Lord, I pray that you just allow us to use this time to learn more about beekeeping, to uh, be uh, better animal husbandry to these insects, Lord. We just love you, and we thank you for, for Christ dying on the cross for us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, our goal here at Five Rivers Bee Clear Club is to reach, teach, and keep beekeepers. So, uh, we reach you by basically telling other people about bees and we tell you about bees and we do our very best to teach you all the knowledge of bees that we know or I can find information about you. So if I, the way to keep you is I help keep your bees alive. Your bees die and you do that a couple of times, you give up and you want to quit that bee business, right? So we want to keep you as beekeepers because we need you as a beekeeper because it helps our whole environment of plants, of pollination, and our food that we eat comes from pollinated bees. We try to have the club meeting every third Tuesday of the month. And uh, so uh, put that on your calendar. We will have another meeting next month. But we have something special coming up this month. On the 29th and 30th will be our state beekeepers convention. So the whole state. And John's going to talk a little bit about just what's coming up with that. But uh, uh, you won't go away on the state convention without learning something. It's in Mountain View. They keep the cost super low for a state beekeepers uh, meeting. Uh, so you'll meet other beekeepers from around the state. We have some special speakers coming in for that. And uh, guaranteed, you'll go away with some bee knowledge, right? Oh, you should. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, our our uh, state president, which is James Ryan, he will be there. He'll speak a little bit. Uh, Vice President Natalie Moon, I'm sure you'll get to meet her. She has been here. James has been here at this club meeting. Um, who else? I don't know. We have. Huh? Yeah. Jacob, yeah. Jacob, yeah, Jacob Bates, uh, our bee inspector that in our area. He'll be there. John Z will be there. I guarantee you'll learn something. If you don't learn something, it's a money back guarantee. Talk to James Ryan and he'll read on your money. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it first here, right? <laughs> Lonnie Perry is the one who said it, just so that you don't tell him, you know. <laughs> That's his alias. I don't know very much, so I figured I better do that. <laughs> and we're kid friendly here. This is our first newbie. Her, B, her name is B. So that's so cool, B. I mean, we love having you here. <laughs> On your table, you have got a little uh, booklet from the University of Arkansas. Uh, on your table, it's a free bee. You like free bees? That's a free bee. Um, our secretary was going to talk just a little bit, and then we'll let William talk and promote uh, the homesteaders. Hi, y'all. I'm done. Y'all probably got some emails and some texts from me. Um, this week or a couple weeks ago, and I appreciate your patience and we're working out all the kinks of the new communication system. So, um, did you all see any of the posts on Facebook about the, his, uh, the, the, yes, you did. 
I, I, somebody else said yes. So did y'all have any questions about about what my ideas were about going forward with the um, website? Basically, I want you to say it's, it's all about data management and then the easy handoff uh, for the next person. Um, so it's it because there's a there's a ton of, of data that is to be managed uh, with all of our information, and I want to keep it secure for everybody and for and make it easier for the next person to step into it. So um, I'm thinking. These these facts, and this is what we talked a little, little bit about last last week, was uh, the website hosting is due to expire November the first. So right now it's got all of the minutes and all of the photos and all of the videos and everything up there. Well, I'm saying let's uh, make it a little bit more user friendly. Google is our friend, don't you think? Maybe. <laughs> and um, so I'm saying we can transfer everything over to, uh, apparently the club does have a YouTube channel, and we transfer everything over there. I think there's only like four or five videos there, but I don't have access to post videos on it. So the video that I posted for last month's meeting is actually on my YouTube channel, which is my old photographic channel, which I don't care, but y'all just... You can look at it there, and we can move it over to the next one once I get access to it. Uh, so in, in, in order to move everything over, then even the officers would be able to have uh, a web, uh, an email. So instead of having Lonnie's personal email out there or my personal email out there, it would be secretary at f, um, yeah, 5rbc dot at gmail.com. So, you know, it, it just makes a little bit of sense. Um, I do feel like over and above Facebook, and that can be our main channel, but over and above Facebook, there are people in this room who do not use Facebook. And I, I believe that Google Blogger, which is a free website, Shut that thing off. Um, um, uh, which, which is a free uh, website builder, basically. It's made basically for people to blog in. It's been out there for eons. Um, please, uh, we, we can use that as a repository for some of this data that people who do not use Facebook have. That's my thought. Let's discuss. Any questions? Any concerns? Basically, you know, uh, most people, uh, their information are as far as be meeting and so forth is a text. Yeah. Uh, so, any additional that is well, the possibly club, through Facebook. Right, but the club has, I don't know if you all know this, step over here, I don't think you're on camera, Mr. Harry. Wave, wave at the camera. Um, um, I don't believe that a lot of people realize this, but there's many, many publications, PDF publications, on our website currently. So that's that's articles. I, in fact, I downloaded. Uh, Jackie had put up a scan of an of an ancient beekeeping book, and I downloaded it and I read it last winter just because of it was something to do about bees. Um, it's that sort of thing that's on that website, and if it's going to go away in November. Let's move it to some place that it can still be there. There are plans for building hives on the website. There are plans for, um, um, and all of course, all of the videos of all of the visits that the club has done. And all of those things can be hosted via this website. As I said, the majority of our communications can be done through Facebook. But I do believe that for the people who do not have or do not want to sell their soul to Meta, that this would be a good option. <laughs> blogger is free. I did build a sample website on the Blogger. And I can uh, share, I'll text all that out and send that. It was on, I did put it on Facebook, but I did not email that out or text it out. We still have a couple of months. November is still yet a, a whole when two meeting two months away? One meeting. One meeting away. So my question would be, would the club members be okay if uh, your um, president, vice president, secretary make that decision and go with it? Do I, 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 I make a motion. I make a motion that you do that. I, I think motion and seconded. And not take up. 
so much of John's time right now. I agree with that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All Yay. opposed? <laughs> Thank y'all. Okay. Uh, treasurer, you got one Who's minute. Saying? Okay, one minute. It's on my clock. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, right quick, Treasurer report is $830.59 as of today. Uh, books are open if you want to look at them. Uh, and that's it for Treasurer. Uh, now, for William, right quick, uh, I will be hosting uh, Saturday the 30th here at Hardy Homesteaders. Uh, I will set up a little Five River Bee Club booth to talk about bees. So that's what the honey donations are for. Uh, it'll be given for free, the honey as samples. Uh, so we'll get your name out there. If you have any cards or anything you want me to pass out, just bring them over and I'll pass those out. When people are like, hey, where can I buy local? I'll pass those out. Uh, and if you have any questions about that, feel free to comment. It to me afterward. Is the information for Hardy Homesteaders on the tables? It is. Okay. At this time, we're going to turn over the meeting to John Z, and he's going to tell us all about the Arkansas State Etymology Program. Whatever. I don't know what you're going to say. Well, we can, we can talk about whatever y'all want. Well, Lonnie said y'all want to hear about Varroa mites. You haven't heard enough about Varroa mites. Never hear enough about Varroa mites. You never, you never have enough Varroa mites, right? Let, let, I got break Well, this little handy-dandy booklet is everything that could possibly go wrong with your bees in one pocket-sized edition. Luckily, most of it's pretty rare, but uh, we do cover Varroa mites and hive beetles in there. Now, uh, I, had, I put this together a few years ago, and, and we had it out for a long time until some fella in New Hampshire called me up one day and asked me about a question about page 39. It turns out there's one word missing. So, if you have hives that are affected by European fowl brood, they do not need to be destroyed like American fowl brood. But, somebody, I won't mention any names, Lonnie, somebody left out the word not on that page. So if you didn't know anything about your European fowl brood and you were relying on this publication for all your knowledge, it says here you do need to destroy your colonies. That is not true. So sorry about that typo. It's a free publication. You get what you pay for. So everybody write in the word not there at the top of page 39. So that's my disclaimer. We have fixed it in, in any uh, new versions that we're going to put out. Now, despite Lonnie's love of Varroa mites, uh, I was actually going to talk about something a little more uh, seasonal, getting your, your colonies ready for the fall and the winter. And one thing, of course, that beekeepers look forward to in the fall is going to lots of meetings. Once you get the honey off the, the hives and everybody has that narrow window between bottling honey and deer season and then all the county fairs where we try to squeeze in that state meeting. So. Uh, you can visit the website for the Arkansas Beekeepers Association, that's arbeekeepers.org. It has the complete program on there, how to register, and it will be at the, uh, the Ozark Folk Center State Park. So, uh, not only did you get to go to the meeting, you get to go uh, watch basket weaving and uh, blacksmithing and hear some folk music over there, so uh, y'all can come down for that. Uh, if you have uh, old eyes and you cannot read the fine print, in this teeny tiny publication. We do have a full size one that you can download or you can pick it up at your extension office. You can visit our website there to, to get that. Any questions about any of that stuff? All right. Well, preparing our colonies for, for fall and winter, think about really when does your beekeeping year begin? And the answer to that, I think, is it doesn't. You just jump in wherever you are. It never <laughs> begins, it never ends, right? Everything goes back to, to what happened last season. Uh, a lot of times we, we think it starts in the spring because maybe that's when we first started uh, our own hives. We got our first nuke, our first package bees. So we started in the spring, we let them build up, but uh, not everybody does that. But, uh, you know, bees are already preparing for next winter when they are there in the spring. The reason bees swarm in the spring is that so they can take advantage of all that extra food and they can build up their population, split it in half, 
Half of them move out, rebuild their population, build enough honeycombs inside a hollow tree, and then store up enough food to get through next winter. That's what that whole spring honey flow is about for bees, is getting through the next winter. So most of that honey that they're going to collect is in a very short period of time in Arkansas. Other parts of the country it's a little bit different, but about April through June is our main nectar flow. If you live out in the Delta where there's a lot of soybeans and things like that, sometimes you can get a real extended flow. Uh, even if the, the crops aren't producing a lot for bees, it stays irrigated. The rest of the state goes dry in the summer, but they're irrigating farms, and so there's a lot of weeds in the ditches that the farmers are trying to get rid of, and the bees are saying, hey, those are delicious. And you can still make some honey over there. Uh, in recent years, herbicide use has really been on the rise, so even those guys in, in the Delta aren't doing as good as they used to. But most of the honey that your bees need for the winter is going to be collected during this time. And of course, most of the honey that we take we can't take it all, we got to leave them their share, but they pay their rent on, on those beehives by giving us our share. So if we want them to be strong and healthy going into winter, then they're going to come out of winter looking good, they're going to build up good next year, and that whole cycle is going to be able to repeat. So the ones that barely survive the winter, they come out puny and weak and scrawny, they don't build up very well, they may or may not do well going through the spring, then, you know, they get hit hard in the summer. And if we don't baby them along, feed them up, then they may not do well the next year. So the cycle just continues again and again. So preparing for next spring starts in the fall, starts now. If you haven't already started, now's the time to be thinking about that. So if you want your bees to be able to survive something like this, which we don't get real heavy snows in Arkansas, and when we do, they, they don't last too long. This is not like, you know, Illinois and Wisconsin where you've got feet of snow. We might get something like that, but, but then it's, it's, it's going to disappear fairly quickly. Uh, but if you want bees to survive that, they can. They can survive the cold much better than they can survive the heat, as long as they've got honey, as long as they've got food. There's a lot of energy in sugar. If you don't believe me, try to put toddlers to bed after trick-or-treating, yeah. right? Yeah. Three Tootsie Rolls and a stick of gum, and they're bouncing off the wall for hours. Imagine if you give your kids nothing but an all-sugar diet all year long. That's what honey is, it's just sugar. So they turn that energy into heat, and they heat that whole cluster to get through the winter. So if you want them to grow and big and strong, then uh, spring management starts now. So really, as soon as you finish harvesting your honey, that's when this process ought to begin. Because uh, there's some things that we want to do to the bees that I keep leaning over. Am I standing I in your trying, way? Just first, I was just trying to read what you said. Okay. So it, some of the things we need to do to our bees we not, may not be able to do while there's honey on the colony that we're collecting for, for human consumption. Some of the the varroa treatments and, and things like that. Some of them we can, some of them we can't, but uh, we need to evaluate each colony, how strong it is, uh, and uh, we need to look at how much honey they've got. You know, we, we want to take it all, but we shouldn't. So depending on how much they've made, how much we take, we need to make sure that, that they've got enough for themselves. We look at the bee population inside of that hive. We've got to have a sufficient number of bees for them to get through the winter. And we want a good quality queen in there who's laying a good brood pattern. She's doing her job. We want her to be strong and healthy because she's going to influence a lot of other things in that colony. And just general overall health. So there's that for old Mike for Lonnie there. So going into the winter, bees need a good home. Don't we all? Something snug and warm. A good queen, we need a good population, good nutrition, all around good health. <laughs> and those are the same things that the bees need all year, but in particular getting through the winter because once they nestle down for that winter nap, they don't really sleep, but uh, once they, they tuck themselves inside that hive, they've got to have everything they need in there with them. So a good home is warm and dry, it's not drafty, you don't want holes in the sides, you don't want a lid that's leaky. You wouldn't want to live in a house like that probably, so neither do the bees. We need it to be secure. Uh, anything that lets in mice, 
and small hive beetles and and uh, varroa mites and or, well ver not varroa but uh, wax moths things like that that can sneak in, in little holes. But mice love to overwinter in a beehive. It's got central heating. As soon as it gets cold outside, the bees all cluster together, and a mouse can make themselves at home. They just chew up a, a comb and they bring in a bunch of debris and uh, they can fit in amazingly small places. As long as it stays cold, the mice love it in there and the bees stay in their cluster. Now then you have a warm day and the cluster breaks up, that mouse is probably going to have a rough time. <laughs> Especially if you have already put on your, your mouse guards. Now the mouse is inside, you can't get out. So what do bees do? Well they'll sting it to death but then they can't get rid of it. That would be like you trying to drag a dead hippopotamus out of your kitchen through that little doggy door, right? <laughs> it doesn't fit. Well, the bees can't do that either. So they go and grab propolis and they smear it all over that dead mouse and they just mummify it. It dries out. It's literally <laughs> skin and bones, but the propolis keeps it from, from rotting. It's a natural antiseptic, antibiotic. So, wow. Uh, you go in there in the in the springtime with your hive tool, and you'll be like, "What's this big lump under here?" And then you scrape out that lump of propolis, and it's got whiskers and bones in it. <laughs> Poor mouse. So, small hive beetles come in every little crack and crevice. Anything smaller than a bee's head has got a, a hive beetle trying to get in through it. So the wax moths are the same way. If you've got a colony that's weak and you're not paying attention. Uh, these guys or the hive beetles are going to get in there. Hive beetles go into hives that, that have a lot of food, but once the food is gone, uh, these guys love that dry comb, and they will destroy your combs. After you have uh, taken empty supers and things off the hive and leave them sitting around, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll destroy those, so we want to keep those in good shape. We want to keep our hives safe from other bees as well. So summertime, it gets hot and dry, and there's not a lot of flowers. Strong colonies rob out weak colonies. So we may want to reduce the entrances and, and things like that so that our colonies can, uh, can, can protect themselves. We want to make sure that we have sufficient room inside the hive, of course, for the, the bees, the brood, and also for the food. And something you never want to do is leave a queen excluder on your hive in the wintertime because that cluster is going to start out down here and move up and when they do they'll all pass right through that queen excluder except for one bee. Ah, what's one bee more or less, right? Except it's that one bee that's kind of important and they're going to leave the, the queen literally out in the cold as the rest of them move up there. So don't want that to happen. And make sure that you remove your queen excluder. We like that queen. She's important. She's the heart of that colony, so we want a, a good one who's in good shape. Uh, we want one that can produce a, a beautiful brood pattern. There's a few empty cells there, but overall, that's a, a really nice one. She's filling up every cell with an egg, uh, so that means that the colony is generally healthy. The queen is in good shape. She's being fed a good, rich diet. That's what we like to see. If you've got a lousy queen who's producing a, a poor brood pattern, you might consider replacing her in the fall. That way your colony population can build up with good healthy young bees before they go through winter and then you've got a failing queen in, in the spring when you may not be able to get a new queen early on. Queens are in high demand in the spring for package bees, for nukes, and things like that. You may not be able to get one early on. So if you replace them in the fall, uh, you can you can break the brood, that helps with uh, varroa mites and, and some of the treatments. But also, uh, once that new queen starts laying, then you just kind of get some, some good genetics in there and, and uh, you'll, you'll get a crop of good, healthy young bees, hopefully. So, it can be hard to find. Do you have a question, sir? Johnny, I wouldn't wait till fall to start trying to get queens. Well, that was my, my next point. You may not be able to find them in the fall. Uh, a lot of the suppliers have stopped breeding them, and if you're trying to raise them yourself, then you, there may not be sufficient drones out there for you to do it. So this is, this is something that we want to do before it gets too late. That's an excellent point. And so it, it's harder to make your own, it's harder to find them. So uh, this is something to think about. Again, early in the, earlier in the, the season, late summer, when you've taken all of your honey off the hive, you're getting everything ready, this is something to consider then. 
But if you try to overwinter a lousy queen, then they may not make it. Uh, sometimes hives go queenless. You can recognize that sometimes because they don't kick the drones out in a queenless hive. So if your hive is full of drones, that's one that uh, you're probably not going to be able to overwinter very easily. Or if you've got a lousy queen who's turned into a drone layer, she's one that, that you don't need to, to take, try to take through the winter either. So if you've got some poor colonies, you can't get a queen, take your losses in the fall. Instead of trying to baby a, a weak hive through the winter, feeding it and hoping for the best, just merge them together with newspaper, with a strong colony that's got a queen, and that way you can overwinter with one larger colony, hopefully a stronger colony, by, by putting those bees together, and uh, it's going to be better to, to get one big colony through the fall than two small ones that you might lose both of them anyway. If you get, a, get it through the winter and it's doing well in the spring, you might be able to split it and get two colonies back out of it early enough that, that they both build up again anyway. But a good strong queen is going to produce a good brood pattern, going to produce a, a good population. I like a hive that's got about eight frames of bees in, in the early fall. That, that means that uh, there's probably going to be enough bees to keep themselves warm going in through the winter. If you've got a little little tiny cluster, then uh, they're not going to not going to do as well. They have to work much harder. Each individual bee has to work a lot harder to generate enough heat uh, in order to, to get through the winter. And so each individual bee's got to eat more food because they're working extra hard and and they they're going to wear themselves out, just exhausting themselves trying to to get through the winter, depending on the temperature and, and a lot of other factors. But if you've got too many bees, then of course they also eat more food. They don't have to work as hard to stay warm, and all of that extra population helps to insulate it. If they're not working too hard, they're very efficient at, at just resting and, and, and holding that heat in there, and they take turns, but too many, you definitely are going to need a little bit more food in there. Uh, you can strengthen a colony that's kind of weak by donating brood from a strong colony. I like to give them cat brood. It doesn't need to eat, it doesn't need to be fed or tended. So if you've got a, a small colony, you can take some cat brood out of a big colony and that way they'll just emerge in that other one and uh, they'll make themselves at home and, and add to that population. But you don't want to overly weaken a good strong colony to try to save a, a little one that, that may or may not even make it. And you don't want to add problems to a weak hive. There's a varroa mite sitting on that bee's head. There, a lot of the varroa mites are in the cat brood. So if you've got a little weak colony and you want to do it a favor, you want to strengthen it, and you take a bunch of cat brood out of a strong colony, you could be transferring a couple thousand varroa mites if you haven't taken care of that issue already. And you now you've put them in that little colony trying to help them, trying to save them, but now you've actually added to their misery. So they may be even more overwhelmed than they were before. So you've got to take care of those little guys. So good general health all around. We want to take care of our bees. We want them free of disease, obviously. Uh, there's brood diseases. Nosema is a, a problem that used to be really associated with winter time and the, the version of Nosema disease that we have now is different than it used to be. There's a, a new strain that came from the Asian honeybees, the Apis serrana. It's harder to detect. It doesn't have this obvious symptom, which is uh, basically bee dysentery. Uh, they can't digest their food, so they make a big mess on the outside of the hive. Used to, it was easy to spot. It was easy to treat with the medication, but this new strain, it doesn't have that obvious symptom, and it doesn't attack only in the winter. It can actually attack in the summertime too. Uh, the, the new Nosema strain is probably present in about half of the colonies in the country anymore. It seems like it's always around. If you have your hives tested for it, it shows up. But it's, it's not necessarily symptomatic. It seems to be induced by stress. When your bees are stressed out by any other condition, poor nutrition, varroa mites, uh, what have you, then when they get stressed out, their immune systems conk out and then this nosema comes out and it can take over a hive. And so it, it really kind of becomes a sort of a silent killer. 
Uh, we don't know enough about it yet, and the medications that we used to use aren't nearly as effective against it as, uh, as they used to be. So uh, that's one to, to watch out for, be aware of, but again, just reduce the stress on our hives in, in every possible way that you can. Is there a test for the, that? There is, uh, you can dissect a bee and look at it under a microscope and, and there's a special tool that you can, call a hemocytometer, you can count the spores. They have to have like a million spores before they get really sick. You could send a sample of bees off to a laboratory and, and have it tested. I think the, uh, the, the National Bee Lab can do that. They don't differentiate between which strain you may have, but it's, it's quite possible. Uh, I, I had the... The bee inspectors did, did some of the, the USDA APIS survey last year at some of my hives, and, and some of them tested positive for it. Never had a problem with it, never saw a symptom. It was there. It wasn't enough that, that I feel like it was a, an issue, but it was present. So the test is just kind of yes or no. It doesn't give you a, a probability that, that it's going to be a problem. So keep your bees. As, as low stress as possible from, from all the other health concerns. Jake can probably test it. He can send it off somewhere. I don't know that they do that okay. testing at, at their, their lab. Viruses are, are always a problem for the bees. There's about 30 different bee viruses, and I think they've actually discovered a couple more in the last few years because oh, no. we keep looking harder and harder at what's going on with bees, and we're finding things that we never knew about before. The bee viruses were always there, but they never had a good way to get between one bee and another, or between one bee colony and another, until the viral mites came along. And they vector viruses left and right. Some of the viruses actually multiply in the mite in between feedings, just to add insult to injury. So we're not battling viruses separate from varroa mites. It's a mite virus complex. About the, there's no cure for these viruses. Although they're, they're working on that, uh, there's some high-tech solutions out there, but to be honest, the beekeeping industry is not that big, so these high-tech companies are not willing to pour the resources into something that they're not going to make a lot of money. And over. there's no natural alternatives to any of it? Are well, they missing you know, something that they're not getting now? Good nutrition helps. Uh, just the presence of propolis inside of a beehive helps. Propolis kills germs, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and of course beekeepers hate propolis because it gets on everything you own and it's sticky and gooey you never get it out of your clothes but it's actually uh, a very useful healthy product that the bees go out and get and they bring it back in their hives and what do we do? We scrape it all out with our hive tool and throw it on the ground, right? <laughs> Oh, we're funny that way. If I scrape it, I put it in a baggie and keep it. You can put it in a baggie and keep it too. Yeah. So, uh, for yourself. For yourself, yeah. It, it, you can sell it as a tincture, you can sell it raw. It, there, it's, it's got yeah. some, some great properties and people do sell it. So uh, yeah, there are some bee, beekeepers that are breeding just for the bees that make propolis. Yeah, but for many years it was not appreciated. It's just been recently that, that people have started to understand how valuable propolis is. So we probably inadvertently bred bees to gather less propolis because we preferred the ones that did not gum up everything in the hive. So they say the Caucasian bee like more of that stuff than most other bees. Uh, I think I think that is right. But they do. There's That's a, what we're running, and it's a total pain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a total pain. But now that we understand how important it is, it's one of those things that we should probably put up with. I have wait. So I don't know if it helped me or not, but I have. For for centuries, people have used it as a natural antibiotic. <laughs> uh, supposedly, ancient Romans used to carry propolis in their first aid kids. So when you get run through with a spear, you know, just <laughs> you're good there to go, you go. right? Yeah. So, up. <laughs> right. So keeping our bees healthy, keep the mite levels low is about the only way to, uh, to get rid of these viruses. And so we want to keep our hives free of mites, relatively speaking. We're never going to get rid of all of them. It's like fleas on a dog. You could treat your hive with every known chemical and get rid of every single mite, and then your bees are going to fly out and 
go rob your neighbor's hive and they're going to bring mites back. So you bathe your dog, you let them out, and they run around, they're going to come back with fleas and ticks. It's just going to happen. But uh, we want to want to keep the mite levels as low as possible. So that's, that's still the number one uh, cause of colony death. So the mites impact the bees' immune systems. It makes them less able to fight off pathogens while the mites are vectoring pathogens to our bees. The damage they do to them is physical. They can't, uh, they're, because they're weakened, they don't generate heat as efficiently to get through the winter time. So it contributes to, to winter mortality of colonies. And individual bees don't live as long. And so if each individual bee loses a few days off of its life, well, big deal, right? Except that bees don't live that long in the summertime. They do in the winter, but your summertime bees don't. But even a couple of days off the end of a bee's life is a significant amount of time because they only forage for, for honey, for, for nectar, the last seven to 14 days of their life. So you take two days off of a bee's life, maybe that's one seventh of the honey that they're gonna produce. A big deal for one bee, but you multiply that over every bee in every colony, then it, it really starts to add up. So mites are a big deal, even though they're, they're little tiny critters. <laughs> There's all kinds of products that you can use to put in your hive, depending on the time of year and whether you've got honey on the hive and, and things like that. And uh, everybody's opinionated. We all like different stuff. About the only thing you can get any two beekeepers to agree on is that the third beekeeper is wrong. Right? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, wheat colonies going into the winter can be dead colonies in the spring. So uh, a lot of people say, oh, I'm all natural. I'm going to let the bees sort it all out. I'm not going to put anything in my hive. Well, you could spend $4 on a mic treatment, or you could spend uh, $180 on some new bees in the spring. There it's you up go. to you. If, if you've got, you got multiple boxes, right? Where, how many places should you put the, the row mic sheet for the treatment? Should you put it between uh, the box? It depends or? on which one. Um, the different treatments have instructions on them that say, you know, for so many frames of bees or, or so many stories. Uh, did you have a question about one in particular? Uh, no, I just got the sheets and didn't know exactly how many I was supposed to put. It's almost always on the brood. Yeah, yeah. Usually, usually they're they're prepackaged, and and it would be like like these strips. It's two strips for a 10 frame box that's got a, a good amount of brood. Or it'll say like one strip for, for five frames of brood. This is an Apigard, it's a thymol treatment. You just peel back the top and you set it on top of the brood box, even if you've got another box on top of it. And then I think, I think it's 10 days later, you put another, another dose in or 14 days, whatever it says. They're always changing the instructions. It's hard to keep up with all that. Um, the Formic Pro, it's got different instructions. Uh, Hot guard doesn't really work that well in yeah. the south. Way as long as you got brood in the hive, it doesn't do a whole lot. For northern beekeepers, it can be fine. They got a long, long broodless period, but uh, not for us. Temperature so, makes a difference. Temperature, yeah, temperature makes a, a big difference, and the amount of brood. So um, we want good nutrition. <laughs> it's a fat bee. <laughs> you can also you get an amen on that. You can go to Man Lake for whatever you bought the strips and. Mm -hmm. You can find what you bought, and at the end of it, there'll be a video that will tell you basically what he said, and there'll be a video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if you didn't buy your equipment or your, your treatments from Man Lake, they, they've got <laughs> educational materials and, on there. And evidently, you're talking about the April bar, and I warn you that we're starting to see where it's not giving us the kill that we need. Yeah, Apovar is uh, being overused, especially in the commercial industry, and a lot of the bees that you buy from out of state. They are bees that have been shipped off to California or Florida or someplace uh, to do pollination runs, and then they shake off all the excess bees before they swarm, and that's what they send off as package bees to, to you and me. So they may have been exposed to all kinds of chemicals before they got to us. Yeah, watch, you know, the Formic Pro does a great job. Just watch the temperatures because you can run them right out of your hive. And then any of the thymol products seem to give us a good kill this year. As long as it's within the, the yeah. right temperature. It's a temp right. Yeah. No cheap. Yep. So bees need good nutrition. They need to, those hives need to be well stocked with honey. 
<laughs> adult bees can live on honey. Your brood needs protein though. So there's there's not there's a little bit of pollen in honey. There's a few micronutrients and stuff in there, but not a whole lot. It's basically just sugar, saturated sugar solution. When you feed your bee, when you take all the honey and you feed your bees back just a sucrose syrup, they're not even getting that tiny bit of nutrition that's in there. So we might add uh, another product to it, like Honey Bee Healthy or that uh, Amino Bee Booster or some of those products that, that add amino acids and proteins back into that. Uh, sugar also doesn't really have an odor, so you feed them straight sugar water. They may not find it right away, but you add a little cap full of Honey Bee Healthy to it, it's irresistible. It's, uh, it's lemongrass oil and, and wintergreen essential oils, but it, it, it's a feeding stimulant. It makes them say, hey, there's something over there. They find it, they'll slurp it down. And it, there's some anecdotal evidence that it, it may change the pH in their digestive system and actually help a little bit with nosema, but I, don't, I haven't been able to, to find anything to, to really back that up, but some people make that claim. John, have you seen any of the trials and tests on, we've been stealing all the honey. And we're, we're went over wintering in single boxes. Mm -hmm. So we got to be right back on top of them with the feed, but it's, we're using sucrose only. We're seeing a lot less trouble in the winter with the bees needing to defecate like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just seems like your stomach's in better order. You seen any of those trials or tests? I that's know Bob Benny's been doing it successfully. And yeah, you know, that's a much bigger issue for northern beekeepers because their bees have to be in the hive for weeks or months at a time in really cold temperatures. But in Arkansas, it does not stay below 55 degrees for months at a time. I mean, it's 70 degrees on Christmas last year. It gets down cold for a week, two weeks, and then it's back up. So our bees are able to, to get out and, and make a cleansing flight. So we don't have the same issues with, with them defecating in the hives the, the way they do in other places. But yeah, that is a valid point if, if your bees are, are stuck in cluster. If you're feeding them anything that they can't digest, then it builds up. And it can, can mimic symptoms of no mm -hmm. So our hives need to be well stocked with honey. Your bees can starve to death three inches away from a comb full of honey. Because our bees may get off over here in a corner, and then we have a cold snap where it stays really cold, they bunch together really tight. In a couple of weeks, they've eaten all the food over here in this corner. The other side of the hive is full of honey, but an individual bee can't leave the cluster and go six inches and fill up her honey crop and come back. Once her body temperature is below about 40 degrees, she'll just stop moving and drop to the ground inside the hive. If it warmed up, within a day, she'd be okay. She could climb back up in there. But if it's too cold, they've got to cluster together and because of the, the way our, our frames are arranged in the hive, bees can move up really easily, they can move along a comb really easily, but that whole cluster has trouble getting around the comb, over the top or underneath or around the end of a comb, to get from one comb to another and move sideways, laterally, to get to food. So that's why you can have a colony starved to death, and you open it up and you've got food two and three inches away from them and they just couldn't get to it. That generally happens when you have a really small cluster, so they, they've eaten everything they can, but they've got to huddle together to stay warm, and there's just not enough bees to actually span the, the other side over there. So, How many pounds of feed are you recommending? In the we're going to get to that in just a second. So more is better. If you're not sure, if there's any doubt in your mind that your bees do not have enough food, sugar's cheap. It's cheaper than buying more bees. If they don't eat it, you can always store it for next year if you need to, but chances are they're probably going to. Can I so, say a question about the sugar? Does mm -hmm. it need to be like the brown raw sugar? Or that is a great question. Do not feed your bees brown sugar. They need a processed They need milk. processed white sugar because what makes brown sugar brown or sugar in the raw or molasses or anything like that, what makes it brown is all the undigestible stuff. Nectar is basically sucrose. It's got some other sugars in it, but it's almost all sucrose. That's what table sugar is. So you want to be able to feed your bees something that they can almost completely digest. If you feed them brown sugar, there's a lot of stuff that they're just going to have to get, get rid of. 
And if they're stuck inside the hive in cold weather, then they just fill up with it. Okay. So in Arkansas, you're going to need a minimum, this is minimum, 45 pounds of honey to get through a, a regular winter here. That's a little bit more than a medium super and a little bit less than a deep super. So somewhere in between, depending on what you're overwintering in, some people do a deep and a medium, but you've got to have that <coughs> one full and some honey in the box down below. If you've got two deeps, as long as that top one is mostly full, that should, should do it, but that's minimum. Bees need more food when the weather is mild than they do when it's cold. If it stayed 50 degrees all winter long or, or below, they cluster together. Most of them are inactive except for the ones right in the middle that are generating heat. But when it gets really warm and cold and warm and cold, bees are flying outside. It's 70 degrees in December. They're saying, it must be spring. Where's all the flowers? They can't find any. They're burning a lot of calories, flapping their wings 200 times a second. So they actually eat more food going out looking and coming back day after day when there's not anything to be, bring back in. So we'll get through the winter you think oh my bees are great and then like you know the end of february beginning of march we'll have a big old cold snap and you think oh spring is here i don't have to worry about it but they've eaten every drop of honey and they haven't quite been able to put anything else back or maybe they've got a little bit but you know they get over on one corner of the hive so uh they they may have we may have disaster strike last couple of years where i live we've had really late cold snaps we've had some snow at the beginning of March so that that can be a real issue and then people always call me up why did my bees all die well did you feed them oh uh, no don't they do that themselves <laughs> I took all of their honey in, in July didn't they make enough in August no not in Arkansas right they also need pollen this is protein so your, your honey is, is fuel, but they can't raise a lot of brood off of just honey. And your bees, believe it or not, they are making brood almost all winter. Even, even in northern states, they're, they're going to be making a little bit of brood, but they don't really shut down. The queen is always, always keeping a few bees going. So we want them to have pollen in that hive. Uh, and, and it needs to be, you know, accessible to them. I figure where the bees have put it is probably where it needs to be. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to move things around. They pack it around the, the brood area. But if I'm feeding them any kind of syrup, I usually give it some kind of additive that, that's got some protein, some amino acids and things like that. And you don't need a lot, but that stuff is pretty concentrated. I like to give them a little bit. But bees have this thing called fat bodies kind of hard to see here and I don't think this diagram is actually completely accurate. Uh, they called it fat bodies because it looked like fat under the skin but it's actually a big gland that sort of functions like a liver. It helps to clean their blood but it stores proteins and bees have to store up a lot of protein inside of their bodies in the fall to make it through the winter. The more protein they have the longer they live but they've got those glands in their head that produce the royal jelly, the brood food, and the queen's food. So they actually digest all the fat, all the protein that they stored in the fat bodies. They sort of digest it, metabolize it, and turn it into royal jelly a little at a time so they can feed the queen all winter long and to continuously be able to feed that brood. You've got really old geriatric bees at the end of winter that have the job of raising the first spring bees before there's a lot of spring flowers. So they're literally digesting themselves in order to raise some sisters before they just give up and, and finally die off as that new generation Strange. takes over. So those fat bodies have to be, have to be stored, store up lots of good stuff. And what we have recently found out about varroa mites because Lonnie loves varroa mites, <laughs> is that the mites themselves feed on the fat bodies. We used to think they were like ticks, and they fed on the blood, because some guy wrote that down in a journal back in like the 1930s. And everybody said, well, that works for me, and we just accepted that fact. Turns out they feed directly on the fat bodies on the adult bees. They like to feed on the, 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 the larva, but when there's no brood, 
they feed on the adult bees and they will actually suck right on the fat bodies. Uh, Dr. Sam Ramsey was a researcher who discovered that. He, he started looking at, at all kinds of molecules and he actually injected special fluorescent proteins in them and found out where they went. It was a, a pretty, pretty wild story that, that he tells about it. But, uh, so that's what those mites are doing. They're sucking the protein directly out of the adult bees. So it's another reason that mites are making the bees have shorter lives and not be able to last through the winter nearly as well. So that's the stuff, like I said, it becomes the royal jelly. They're feeding the queen and what they're feeding the, the brood there. So good summer bees raise good fall bees. And then the fall bees raise the winter bees and the winter bees raise the spring bees, right? But in the summertime, if that varroa mite level is really high, basically those bees are sucked dry and they're supposed to be feeding these fall bees and those bees are full of viruses from the mites. They're not well fed, so they're not in great shape. And then they're supposed to raise these winter bees that have to live for three, four, five, six months sometimes. So if you don't have good fall bees, then you're not gonna have good winter bees. The cycle backs up several brood cycles. So we want good, healthy, fat bees in the summertime, towards the end of the summer, early fall so that we have good spring bees. It's all connected. When you place in your hives to begin with, think about the winter time. Where does the, the prevailing wind come from in the winter? All that, that snow and ice and, and storms, which direction do they come from? Uh, so we want to maybe place them where they've got a little bit of shelter, a fence, a, a barn, a good thicket of, of brush, something like that. If you've got your bees out in the middle of a pasture with nothing to stop the wind, you know, stack some hay bales around it or something like that. That helps them in, in the spring too. And we you know there's good wind. Those bees are coming and going. Just gives them a little bit of a wind break as, as they're trying to land and take off. So you don't, they don't have a big crosswind that they're fighting. Uh, we, we like to face our beehives towards the, the morning sun. Uh, that seems to be what bees choose in nature. If they have a choice, they did a lot, bunch of experiments with hives during different directions, and natural swarms always pick the one where they can go in and has morning sun shining on the, the landing board. Uh, I would put a brick on top of a hive or a nice big rock. I had a, had a buddy who, who kept some bees out in a pasture up on a hill, and he came out one time in like November, after a big storm and all of those big heavy wooden telescoping lids had flipped up off the hive and were laying out there with all the cows. So the wind can get up under the corner of those hives and lift the lids off despite all the propolis and everything else. So this is Arkansas. If you look hard enough, you can probably find a rock. <laughs> if you can't afford a brick. No. That's right. And I have some extras. If You've got some extras? <laughs> Are you going to deliver those? Uh, you gotta, uh, gotta I'm pick storing them, all? them up. Oh, okay. Beekeepers. Storing them for, for winter. Got it. All of them you got down there at your place, it's all Little Rock. That's right. <laughs> they used to be bigger. but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We don't have a great fall honey flow in Arkansas, most places. We do get some, some flowers. There's a lot of asters, black-eyed Susan, things like that. We get a good goldenrod and some other stuff, but compared to, to other places, if you, you start reading some of the literature, these books on beekeeping that are written by people in Ohio and Pennsylvania, they talk about the fall flow. They literally have another honey flow in a lot of places, uh, but we don't get that here, usually. Occasionally we, we get some, some good forage, but it's not enough that you can take all the honey in July and just expect the bees to build up again. So uh, don't, don't count on that. Uh, brood production slows down as a result of poor diet. So we kind of reach our, our peak population here with the bees about the end of the spring honey flow. And that's because as long as the bees are bringing in lots and lots of pollen, feeding the queen lots and lots of royal jelly, those summertime bees, spring bees, they only live about 36 days. That's their whole lifespan. 
but the queen could be laying 1,500, 2,000 eggs a day. So she's outlaying them at a faster rate than they're dying of old age. So you get this exponential growth. But then when the nectar flow stops or tapers off, there's not nearly so many flowers with pollen, then the worker bees are not feeding the queen as much. So when she gets a less rich diet, her egg production slows down, and now the bees start dying off faster than they're being born, and so that population starts to go down. And this is just the natural cycle. Again, some states, if you get a great fall flow, you see kind of this bump, but it still goes back down towards winter. Then in the spring, they start building up. These are those old bees that are digesting themselves to feed off, feed, feed up and, and produce some brood here before there's a lot of flowers. So they're, they're trying to keep that population from dying out completely. But, uh, you know, things are constantly changing inside of a beehive. Uh, it would be great if you could just set it up and it's all perfect and then we could walk away and leave it. But it's like trying to take a road trip on cruise control and you just take a nap. Right? Set it on 75 and close your eyes, everything will be fine. A couple hours you'll be at your destination. Yeah. Those self-driving cars, they, they work great, right? Well, beehives are a constant adjustment. A little to the left, a little to the right. We always got to be tinkering with something. And that's kind of just human nature too. We can't leave well enough alone. But uh, we're trying to keep our bees on, on a good path. But things are always changing and it's not just the bees that are building up in the hive. Lonnie wanted more mites, so here they are. Your mite population also grows, but what do the mites eat? They, want, they can only reproduce on live bee larvae. So the mite population might be low, but then when the bee population starts to build up, the mite growth is right behind it. Now during the, the nectar flow here, the bees are outrunning the problem. The queen is laying eggs faster than the mites can keep up, and it's, it's acceptable for a long time. You might have six mites per hundred bees, a 6% infestation when we get to the, the peak population here. And then of course the bee population starts to go down, but the mite population is still growing because the mites are feeding on bees. They don't care about the flowers outside. There's still plenty of bee brood. So here in the fall, you've got one out of every three bees may be parasitized by a mite, doing all that crazy damage. And these are the, the bees, of course, that, that are kind of important. There's fewer drones, right? The queen, when the queen is fed less, she, she stops making drones. And then, of course, they kick the drones out eventually. But mites prefer to, to parasitize drone brood because the drones stay in that cat stage for about three extra days compared to workers. If a mite gets in a drone cell, then it can have an extra one or two babies successfully than if it got into a worker cell. The mites know that. They're crafty. They figured that out. They can tell the difference. They can smell the difference. And they will be attracted into the drone cone. This is how you can use those drone-sized frames to, to trick them into moving in there, and then you can take those out and freeze them overnight, those green plastic combs, you've probably seen those. They work great if you keep up with them. Most people put them in the hive with the best of intentions, and then they forget about them after a couple times. And when you do that, you're raising more drones, which are hungry, eating machines. They're like teenage boys. They are teenage boys. That's what they are. They're just eating everything in sight, plus you're also manufacturing more varroa mites than you would have had had you not tried to put that drone trap in there. So use it or don't use it. But if you're going to use it, use it right. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, the, the little uh, bee book has a, a section on, on drone trapping. You can read about those. So the bee population is going down. These mites are now shifting on to worker brood. When they're only feeding on drone brood, they don't affect the productivity of the colony that much. The varroa mite comes from Asia. Their original host was the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana. In the Apis serrana hives, mites, the varroa mites only attack drones. They do not attack workers. And if the population of mites gets too high, that the drones are being so affected by them, then the drones just die 
what, in, in the pupil stage, well, the cell is capped, and then the mites can't get out, and they die in there, and then the workers clean it out later. So they kind of have a self-limiting cycle to, to the way they work in those bees. But after these mites moved into the Apis mellifera, the European bees, the western honeybees, they started feeding on our drones, but then they said, hey, your workers are delicious too. And so when they attack workers, then it impacts the entire colony in lots of ways. So now that there's fewer drones, and then the drones are getting kicked out, but the queen's not making any more drone brood, then in this period, the mites are shifting to worker brood. And so all the viruses and everything else are now moving into the workers. And they, so they are physically weakening the bees, they're spreading pathogens, and they're doing it in much larger numbers, a bigger proportion of the bees in the colony. And now we have this period where the winter bees are being reared. So you've got bees that are sick, they're weak, they're full of viruses. One out of every three bees is being affected, perhaps. And so we've got these poor quality bees that are supposed to rear a generation of bees that are supposed to make it all the way through the winter and live for several months. And so if, if they can't do that, if they can't be reared by healthy fall bees, then that's when we have a lot of winter mortality in our colonies. So it's a lot of information, it's a lot of details that all are working together, but this is one of the main reasons why colonies are failing in the wintertime. This is a detailed diagram here. Randy Oliver put this together, but it actually came from a fella who did this for his uh, master's research in Manitoba, Canada, many years ago, I think in, in the 1980s. But just real quick, so this is the age of bees in a colony at different times of the year. This red is 0 to 12 days, 13 to 24 days, up to 36 days, etc. These bluer bands down here, uh, as as the, they go through the winter, these bees are really old, 250 days old, some of these bees. This is in Canada, so long winters. So here, this is May, June, July, August. In the summertime, you have a large proportion of young bees because they're born, they grow up, they work themselves to death, but they're being constantly replaced, so you have a lot of really young bees. Then. As you get into the fall here, the population is dropping, but the proportion of bees gets older and older and older. So this is what I was, I was talking about, but you can see how there's hardly any young bees, but there's always a few. Even in Canada, those queen bees are raising brood all winter long. Just a few here in January, February, March, April, and then boom, the population builds up. That's when the spring nectar floods. This is the, the spring turnover, this is the fall turnover. That summer bee, winter bee difference is, is it's, it's a big difference physiologically. They are completely different bees in the, the way their, their bodies are working. So we've got these winter bees that are reared by unhealthy bees. They don't survive as long. And if we apply a mite treatment, as soon as possible, once you have harvested your honey, Whatever that is for your particular area, when you get around to it, then that mite population drops down, then these bees here in the summer have a chance to recover from that. The bees themselves that are alive are still sick, they're still weak. It takes two to three brood cycles for them to recover from that and help feed other bees and not pass on all of those viruses or allow the, the mites to pass on those viruses. We'll never get rid of all the mites, but we can get them down low enough that they have very little impact. Then the bees that are reared at this time of year are fat and healthy, full of protein, <laughs> low viruses, longer lived in the winter, and able to help build up those spring colonies. So these are the bees we want. They're physiologically different than summer bees. They store all these proteins. They, they live a lot longer, up to six times as long. Uh, they, their hypopharyngeal glands, those are the brood food glands, are bigger and more active. They produce a lot more food. And this uh, protein called vitelligenin is uh, also stored in the fat bodies, and it promotes health and vigor and long life. It's uh, 
the queen bees are full of vitelligenin. It's an egg precursor protein is what they call it. So she needs a lot of that in order to produce eggs, but it's associated with, with good health and vigor and, and long life. And so we want uh, bees that, that have all of this built up, but then there's that varroa mite sucking them dry. Is that something you can give them? You cannot give them vitelligenin. You give them a rich, a protein-rich diet, or you allow them to go out and get all the pollen that they need and bring it back in, and they metabolize that themselves. Yeah, I don't think you can buy vitelligenin on the, in a bottle and feed it to them. But uh, you can buy you can buy royal jelly and you can eat it yourself, and it's supposed to make you live to be 150. <laughs> yeah, See, I'm 95. <laughs> I love it. Varroa mite treatments. So we talked about this a little bit. I keep moving out of your frame, right? Yeah, it's because I'm camera shy. There's all kinds of treatments, and everybody always asks me, well, what do you use? You're the bee expert, so you must have it down. Well, I, I use different products, uh, but if you aren't familiar with them all, this is a great resource. You can snap a picture of that with your, your camera if you want, but uh, the website for the Honey Bee Health Coalition is really great. They've got this tool on here, uh, the Varroa Management Decision Tool. So if you know you've got mites, you do, then, uh, and you're not sure what to do about them based on the time of year and the bee population and different things, and, and there's different products and, that you're not sure about, this can help you. So it just asks you a series of, of yes or no questions. There's only like five or six of them. So, you know, have you sampled your mites? Are there a lot? Uh, are you willing to use a synthetic chemical or are you trying to stay with all natural products? Uh, do you have brood? Do you have honey supers on? What time of year is it? And based on your answers, it, it asks you another question and then it will generate a list of these products that would, would meet your criteria. And then their website has videos that show how to sample mites. It shows how to use each of these products. And it's all very, very scientifically accurate. And so this is a, a, great, a great website. We've got some great resources. And it will uh, kind of educate you on all of these different, uh, different products that you can use. Now. The bees are expelling drones in the fall because those guys haven't done anything all summer long. <coughs> they lounge around with their feet up. They got lots of feet. And when they get hungry, they just say, Hey, uh, sis, bring over some honey, right? I need a refill. Or they'll just go and slurp it right out of the cell. It's like your, your kids drinking milk out of the carton. Right? <laughs> so then uh, the workers wake up one day and they say, You know what? It's getting cold. We're not going to produce any more queens this year. Let's get rid of those guys. And they'll kick them out. If you've still got drones in the hive, like I said earlier, in the winter time, you're probably queenless. Or you've got a, a poor queen who's, who's gone drone layer. But uh, this is when you can, you can grab a handful of those drones, because drones don't have stingers, right? And you've got a neighbor next door who's still not quite sure about your, your newfound hobby. And you keep telling them, oh, you're fine on the other side of a chain link fence. They won't bother you. Well, now you just grab a handful of drone bees, and you walk over and you say, hey, Bob, did I ever show you how, how friendly my bees are? You put some in your pocket, and they walk all over you because they can't sting you. They'll think you're crazy, and they'll stay away from you. They won't want to borrow your lawnmower or anything. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> You can take a drone and put it on a little piece of thread, just make a little loop, and you can tie it onto a safety pin, and you can put that on your kids and send them off to school. Yeah. Sure and tell. You'll get, your safety pin. Too. You'll get your safety pin back at the end of the day, but it's not going to have a B on it. <laughs> it's going to have a note on it. It's going to have a note on it. Yeah. It may not be very You ever seen though. washboarding? What's that about? I've gotten this question a whole bunch this summer. And uh, the bees, they get in this position. They all seem to be facing the same direction. Their, their back four legs are in place, and their front legs, they're, they're scraping down, and they're using their mandibles, their mouth parts, and they're doing something there. And everybody wants to know, what is this? And nobody's really sure. To me, it looks like on the old-time sailors, on the old-time sailing ships, they'd have them scrubbing the deck, keeping it clean. 
That's what it looks like to me. That would keep them out of trouble on those long sea voyages. You know, there wasn't a whole lot else to do but just drink your frog and start fights, I guess. So uh, <laughs> the, the captain would keep them busy just for, for uh, you know, keep them out of trouble. And nobody really, really understands what's going on here, but uh, recently some people have suggested that it's because we're looking at this behavior on a nice, flat, smooth, painted surface. But if we start looking at bees in the wild, they do this too. And when bees are doing this on a natural surface, like a, a rough tree, where they, they're coming and going out of this, then uh, over time, they actually, whoops, they actually smooth out this whole area and they rub it down where it's probably easier for them to come in for a landing. And so this, is, this behavior is probably a, a holdover from, you know, when bees were, were living in the wild. We've given them uh, this, but they don't know what to do. But there's an abundance of bees in the, the late summer with very little to forage on, so the queen bees got them out there swabbing the deck. Just to keep <laughs> uh, you put them to work. Puts them to work, exactly, yeah. So another thing bees do is go out and gather a lot of propolis. And again, this is associated mostly with the end of summer, early fall, and people say, oh, the bees are getting ready for winter. They're sealing up, they're caulking the hive. You know, this is that propolis that we were talking about. So it gets on everything, and you'll never get it out of your clothes. Anything you take out to your beehive is permanently part of your beekeeping operation for, for pretty much forever. But uh, she's got some there on her back legs. Sometimes you'll find bees coming in with propolis on their pollen baskets. And I think they even have to have another bee help take it off because uh, it's, it's pretty sticky and gooey. But they do seal up cracks and crevices mm -hmm. to keep out drafts. But they also smooth out any rough surfaces inside the hive. And uh, it, it helps to clean it as the bees are walking along on that propolis inside. They're basically washing their hands. When bees clean out a brood cell, after a, a, a pupa has, has emerged as an adult bee, they go in and clean out that cell. They actually get some propolis and kind of polish and varnish the inside. And it makes it perfectly sterile, ready for the, the queen to lay another egg on it. If you, if you took a, a really old, old comb that's been used for, for years and generations of bees, if you slice through it, you can see layer after layer of bee cocoon and propolis and bee cocoon and, and propolis built up inside there. But as a beekeeper, you can install a propolis trap. So this is actually something that uh, you can harvest. Uh, it looks like a queen excluder, but it's too small for the bees to fit through, even the workers. And the holes in the propolis trap are kind of a, a trapezoid shape. They're wider on one end and, and smaller on the other. And if you put it on top of a hive, and you don't have to prop it up like that, but just a little bit so that there's a draft of air or any sunlight coming through, then the bees will fill in all of those gaps. They can't fit through it. They can't build comb there, but they'll seal it all off with propolis. And then you take this out of your hive and put it inside of a trash bag and put it in your freezer overnight. So propolis gets cold, it gets really hard and brittle. And then you do this in a trash bag because you flex these propolis traps and because it's a, like a trapezoid shape, it pops out one side and you can collect it all <coughs> in the trash bag. What's that? Like an ice tray. Yeah, kind of like an ice tray. And so you can collect it all inside of that bag Otherwise, it just goes everywhere, so you don't want to do that. So, why would you want to collect propolis? That's just raw balls of propolis. That, that's what bees do if you, you let them go. They just seal everything in place there. Sorry, I'm edging out of it. I'm doing it because she can't see when I'm standing here. I'm, I'm blocking everything. But uh, the reason you might want to do that is because it's worth money to some people who would never have their own bees. But uh, this is... This is an ounce of propolis goes for over 12 bucks. And here we are just throwing it on the ground, right? This is a tincture, 15, 20, 25 dollars for a little one ounce jar. Dirty little secret about this stuff is it's about 95% moonshine. It's ethanol, just Everclear. 
Make sure you use a food grade alcohol to, to produce it. But it's only got a tiny bit in there. It's mostly mostly alcohol, but you know, people love alcohol, right? So it just makes it better. But there's all kinds of books and materials out there and websites and magazine articles that tell you how great everything is in a beehive. It'll cure everything that that ills you. And people who are looking for natural remedies have already read all this stuff and they already want your product. It's just a matter of you putting your product in front of them and making them aware of it. If you're not a medical doctor, you may not make any medical claims. You, you may even have to put some kind of disclaimer on it that says that the FDA has, has not approved this. This little jar here, I found this picture online. I, I love this uh, disclaimer. Good for all kinds of stuff. Use it at your own risk. <laughs> you can't get much simpler than that, right? There's a store in, in Little Rock, a health food store, that sells bottles that size for about 12 bucks. So an ounce of, of Everclear alcohol and a little blob of uh, propolis. And you can dissolve it in alcohol. That's about the only thing, maybe dry cleaning fluid, but nothing else. You can't dissolve it in water or anything else. Like that, but. So what should beekeepers be doing? Consolidate your hives. Get it down to the, the size that it needs to be for the winter time. If they have not drawn out the foundation, they're not going to this time of year. You can't pay bees enough to get them to, to draw out comb right now. So any empty supers, if they haven't put anything into it yet, then just take those off because they're not going to be filling them. Unless you know they don't have enough food and you need to, to feed them a bunch of syrup. They will fill drawn combs, but they won't draw out foundation. That's why there's a question mark there. So uh, you need to take it off if you've got a lot of excess supers. You went and put three or four supers on because you had big plans, and the bees only filled one or two. Well, remove those other ones and save them until next year. You can rearrange your hives. <clears throat> Think about what the bees need to be doing, where they're going to be in a, a natural situation, and how we, can we mimic that with the hives that we have. So, in a hollow tree, the bees have a, usually a narrow space, but it's really tall. So the cluster can fill that whole six to nine inches inside of a tree, and they can move up and down, you know, several feet. Well, our hives are square, and they're divided up like a slices of bread, and it's a little bit different. But bees start at the top. That's where they build their honeycombs, and they build them down when they first start to colonize this tree. As they build it down, the queen bee keeps moving down and laying <coughs> eggs. As the brood hatches out at the top, those cells become empty. They start storing honey at the top. And they start filling down as they collect it. And it kind of keeps the queen down low. Wherever the brood is, they, they pack pollen in around it. You can see this in your own hives. Where do they put the most pollen? Right around the brood nest, right? So that's the way the bees want it. Wherever. Wherever the bees, when it gets cold, wherever that queen bee is, wherever there's a patch of brood, that's where they cluster. And then all winter long, they move back up and they are eating that honey. Hopefully, at the end of the winter, early spring, they haven't eaten it all, and then they're going to start that migration back down. So the queen starts laying eggs, they start bringing in more honey, it pushes everything down. In the winter they go back up, up and down, up and down. So this is what happens in nature. This is what we want to mimic in our big rectangular hives. So we want the brood in the bottom with honey, maybe a frame of honey on each side, but all the brood combs in the middle with pollen, pretty much in the arrangement that they have, and then all the food in the top. So as they move up in the winter, they're moving on to food. If you've got a mixture of, of capped honey and empty combs, put the capped honey on the outside, put the empty combs in the middle, and feed them because they will start filling them usually in the center and work out, and they may never actually move out to the outside. So put the capped stuff on the outside and keep feeding them until they have, have filled up as much as they need. So how much do you need to fill them? If you have any doubt whether they have enough, keep feeding them. Sugar is much cheaper. If it gets really cold, don't try to feed here at the entrance. Because individual bees up in the top of the hive can't come down here, get a drink, and go back up if it's too cold. You want a hive top feeder that uh, they can actually cluster right underneath that, that feeding port and up in the top. 
Remember to remove any queen excluders at this time, and you can close off your screen floors. You can probably leave screen bottom boards open in the <coughs> south, but you do get a cold draft that comes in there, and then, you know, later in the spring, it, when they're trying to produce some brood, we don't want a, a whole lot of cold air in there, so uh, we want to close those off. And you put your mouse guards on, if that's something that you need to do. Uh, you want to do that before it starts to get cold, before it drops down to 55, so the mouse doesn't get in and you go out on a brisk autumn day when it's 48 degrees outside, you say, it's time to put on my mouse guards. Now you trap that mouse on the inside. So, don't want to do that. And then, any medications that, that you feel like you need to give them, if you haven't done that already, you need to take care of that. So. Be nice to your bees. Do right by your bees. They're working hard. So we want to make sure that we've got everything ready for wintertime. When do you start feeding the bees? When do you start feeding your bees? Well, it depends on how much food they've got and how much, uh, how much honey did they produce, how much did you take. Uh, bees are going to be eating more than they can produce in August. So if you have taken a lot of honey, and then you realize, ooh, I took more than I should, start feeding it back to them. Feed them sugar syrup or give them back some of their own honey. But uh, earlier is better as far as when should you feed them. You want to get them up to the, the proper weight going into winter. So they need it. They need it in the summer. They need it in the winter. Okay. You can't give them too much food. So even besides the sugar water, you need to give them something else. Even yeah. in the summer? Well, in the summertime, if you've got a lot of wildflowers around, even not a lot, but you've got some, if they're bringing in pollen, they may be okay. But if they're storing up all that syrup for winter, then adding some kind of a protein, amino acid solution to it can only benefit them. It's one of those things, it's like taking a multivitamin, should you? Well, if you eat a balanced diet, you probably don't need to be taking those pills. It probably can't hurt you, it might help you, but it's not going to hurt to, to take extra vitamins. But as long as you're eating fresh fruits and vegetables, you probably may not need that, right? So, diet and exercise. Yes? We're doing the, uh, the sugar water mm -hmm. through a regular feeder type thing, you know, like a chicken feeder, mm -hmm. rocks and it's in there. Mm -hmm. We have a problem with the sweat. Okay, so you're, you're feeding outside the hive. Open feeding. That's called open feeding, yeah, or community feeding. And not only are you feeding your bees, you're feeding his bees and her bees and his bees. <laughs> and sweat you, bees. Yeah, and, and the sweat, sweat bees, bees and the bumblebees, yeah. So if you don't want to be feeding everybody's bees, then you can switch to an internal feeder. You can take one of those jar feeders and just put it upside down over the inner cover, that hole in the inner cover. Uh, or you can get a bucket feeder or something else to feed inside. Uh, you can get the, the frame feeders, the division board feeders that, that you can fill. Uh, those work too. There's all kinds of feeders that you can put inside. But if you put them outside, yeah, you, that's the risk you run. And, and also right outside the actual door itself. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Right. If you if you're feeding a if you're open feeding too close to your hives and that feeder runs dry, and you've got a lot of other bees coming over because there's no other food around, when that jar goes dry, they're going to look up and say, hey, there's some food in there, I can smell it. And they may start robbing out a colony if, if, if it's not strong enough to defend so itself. It's best to go with an internal It's best to go with an internal feeder for that reason. Also, if um, bees have nosema, it's spread in, in, through their digestive system. And if you've got a hive that's got no semen, and you've got a, a bunch of other hives that are all feeding it from the same trough, there is a chance that you can spread that disease to other bees. Is there a problem with treating mites and doing the internal feeder at the same time, or should you? No, no, there's, there's no problem with that. Anything that you're using, any of the approved products that you're using to, to treat your hives should not be affecting the, any of the, the food in there. Yes, sir. John. You mentioned the pro 
proteins, you just kept saying solutions, but you never said anything about pollen patties. Do you use them or not believe in them? Uh, you know, pollen patties uh, are also acceptable. I don't use pollen patties. I question sometimes whether bees are eating it all or if they're carrying some of it out. I never see them actually storing anything in the comb the way they do bee bread. So I think that they're probably going to get get more of it if I feed it as a liquid. But yeah, uh, a lot of people do that. Uh, you can feed a dry pollen or protein powder outside. They'll bring it in. Um, you can feed them pollen patties inside. I also don't like to promote hive beetles in right. my hives, so that's the main reason that I don't use pollen yeah, patties. Yeah, you've got to be very patties. careful. With, we, we prefer to dry, mm -hmm. and that's when we have seen them pack it in. Yeah, and, and I've never seen them eating the dry stuff inside the hive. That, that's weird. something you need to put it in a dish outside and cover it, and they'll bring it back in if they want it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to give them something inside that they have to carry back out. So is there a solution that you recommend that's... Uh, there's several products. Uh, one that I've been using the last couple of years, and I don't know if it's the best, but I've got a bunch of free samples, so I've been using it. It's called Hive Alive. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's, it, it is good stuff. I, I, I mean, I assume it is. I haven't had any colony deaths. <laughs> they seem to be thriving with it, but it's... It's a seaweed extract, it's got vitamins, it's got amino acids, and it's produced over in Ireland. But, Have you uh, done anything with the probiotics? I, probiotics are another thing that I don't think are terribly necessary if you haven't been feeding your bees a lot of antibiotics. Again, it, it could help, can't hurt probably, but I haven't seen a whole lot of evidence. Okay. And you can make a case for it, but... You know. What's that? They keep trying to sell it to us, so I just wanted to keep that. They do, and, and it could very well help. Same thing for dogs. We asked our vet about it, though, and she said it's all marketing. It's the same, same for people. Stuff. There's no proof that it does. Yeah, yeah people, some people will, will try to eat as much probiotics as you can. I mean, you can just eat yogurt and you get a lot of that, too. Yeah. But um, yeah. if you have fed your bees any antibiotics for, like, uh, European fowl brood, that gets rid of all the bad bacteria, but it gets rid of all the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of bacteria that bees actually need, mm -hmm. like the um, uh, lactobacillus. It's what processes the, the, the pollen into bee bread. It makes lactic acid and, and actually helps, helps out a lot. It's very important. And it keeps the nectar from fermenting inside the, the colony while they're turning it into honey. And, it does a lot of good. So, yeah, if you have treated with antibiotics, probiotics probably good. But there's not a. I haven't seen a lot of compelling evidence that we need it. If your bees have access to the outside and access to good fresh pollen, they're probably not going to need that. Okay. So the pollen patties that you're talking about, is that where I remember we didn't have our bees yet? So when we were coming before last year, somebody brought in a bunch of goldenrod, and we're talking about doing something with that flower because it's not a powder and it's stickier. Is that what you make your pollen well, we, patties We make from? our own. You know, we make five, five tons of it a year. But we're very careful with it because of high beetles. Mm -hmm. And I mean, used to be you could throw a pound on or even two yeah. pound on a strong high and you'd be fine, you'd get it down. But now we're doing half pound, quarter pound. I mean, really careful with it. What he's talking about is it literally looks like a hamburger patty. Uh, it's, it's not even, most of them it's are like not actually butter. made with, with uh, pollen. Yeah. It's a protein supplement made from brewer's yeast, soy protein, flour. Egg protein. And yeah. We use the Alter B out of Man Lake. Uh, Randy Oliver tested several and found that to be the closest to real pollen. Then we throw in, in yeah. a hundred pound batch, we throw in twenty pounds of real pollen. Yeah, you mix it with sugar and a little yeah, bit of water, and, and you make sugar. kind of a paste, and you you plop it down on like uh, wax paper, and you set it in the hive, and and the bees do eat it. They'll eat anything if you put enough sugar in it, just like people. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but if the bees aren't eating it fast enough, then the hive beetles go crazy on it and really multiply. And just be full of worms. Yeah. All right. That is Can you pronounce the last name how? Zavishlak. Oh, Zavishlak. I love that.
Zavishlak. Zavishlak. It helps if you do this. Zavishlak. <laughs> Say it like you're like it's Klingon. Zavishlak. Or better, John Z. There you go. <laughs> yeah. The well, answer to that, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah anyway. We thank you, John, for coming. And, Always uh, good. We're welcome. We thank you so much. Uh, thanks, y'all, for coming. Uh, one of the things that she mentioned, which kind of spurred a, a question about the uh, uh, goldenrod, I brought in uh, some goldenrod last yeah. year. Uh, after the the goldenrod is at its peak right now. And if you'll watch, and as it kind of dies down and it starts to turn brown, you can go, I did, and I cut those goldenrod heads off, put them in a feed bag, kind of shook them up, and all along my uh, ditch going to my property and the neighbor's ditch, I throw goldenrod seeds all there that had no goldenrod and this year I had goldenrod in that ditch from where I planted it. So if you want goldenrod for your bees to feast on right now, you're going to have to plant it this fall. It's so simple. Just yeah. Goldenrod's a great pollen source for bees because it blooms in the fall basically until it freezes. Yeah. And it, it makes a copious amount of pollen. So you your bees need that right now and it's really simple. Uh, one of the flowers that uh, you can plant any, you know, right now, or you can, after they, they die and turn brown, just cut those heads off and just throw them in the ditch. So right now, even though they're not dead and they're right, blooming, wait. can you just throw some down and they'll eat from them? Or no? no, no. I'm talking about uh, after it's dead, when, next year, yeah, you're no, going to... You're going to... No. No, they won't, they won't get anything out of it. Uh, the other thing that at my house right now, my farm, they're getting lots of nectar from perilla mint. Uh, I hate that. <laughs> I hate perilla mint because it's an evasive weed that is toxic to cows, uh, uh, goats, if it's in the wilted stage. It's fine. Normally the cows will not eat it, uh, will not touch it, but you, it can wilt and if you put it in a hay bale or something like that and it's in the wilted stage, if it's dry, no problem. If it's green, no problem. They won't probably eat it. But uh, to make a tremendous amount of nectar, and that's what we want. So I, I don't like it, but it, it's out there. Another one that's blooming right now is Cerisa lespedeza, another evasive weed that I hate. <laughs> but it, it does, the bees do work it. Uh, so, Cerisa lespedisa. It's an invasive bee uh, weed. What have you got woolly crouton? Nothing that I know of. <laughs> I've never seen a bee on it, but maybe. Yeah. Yeah. The, the little daisies, the yellow daisies that we see out there right now, which I call them like little baby sunflowers, they do get something off of that. Anyway, thank you all for coming. I.